combined authority uh, specific uh, systems that we have looked at during the period. Again, you will remember previously that I've talked about the fact that our work has largely been concentrated on uh, giving advice and guidance to these systems and processes as they have been developing. Uh, we are now move, starting to move into the delivery of some substantive internal audit work in those areas, um, focusing on um, households into work, for example. We've also made a start on some work on housing first, and we are also in the early stages of scope and some work on the, with the investment team also. Um, but we've also completed uh, some um, orders of a significant number, uh, significant value of uh, grants during the period as well. In terms of the Mersey Travel specific systems, uh, detail is given here uh, for your transparency, for transparency purposes. Um, this falls entirely within the remit of the Audit Risk and Governance Board, but nonetheless is here for you to, um, to, to, to view. And then in section six, we talk about the Quality Assurance and Improvement Programme, which is really how internal audit seeks to comply with the internal audit standards and to develop and improve um, its operation and performance over time. And I've given for you uh, there some detail in terms of the key performance measures that we have adopted, um, which previously um, approved by this committee, um, looking at particularly around our compliance with those internal audit standards, but also the percentage of the plan completed. Um, and you will notice that there is a negative variance there in terms of, of, of the percentage of the plan we're not unfortunately where we would like to be um, on that, but there are a number of, of factors that I can, can go into if, if members would like uh, when we get into, uh, into questions. But otherwise, the, the, the performance indicators are looking positive. And then as we move to uh, the second section six, apologies, we seem to have a, a number duplicated, but uh, the one that starts on page 26, that takes us through the, um, the self-assessment that I've recently um, undertaken in terms of the public sector internal audit standards and looking at how we uh, fulfil the requirements of those, which has led to um, the dip in terms of the percentage of compliance, which has emanated from a more um, prudent assessment, I think, than, than was perhaps previously the case, um, and a set of um, actions and areas for development, which are very much complementary to the improvement and modernisation journey that the, the, the service is now uh, uh, on. And then Appendix A um, is an update on, on every audit in the plan, so it just gives you a, a snapshot really of where we are in terms of, of delivery of each of those pieces of work. I'm very happy to take any questions. Do we have any questions? Or Um, just regarding the overdue audits that are showing um, and there's a, a, a note revised implementation date required, but some of these go back to 1718. So I'm just wondering if there's any concern about the fact that they've gone for so long and still asking for delays when it indicates that there's an impact, the median impact. Yes, um, there certainly is a number of recommendations that date back um, a, a number of years. Um, I think one thing that I would say is that the narrative in the report would always draw to your attention any areas that I felt were of concern. And even though some of these are rather historic now, I'm not in a position to be saying to you that they, call, they are causing me any concern. Um, what we have to be cognizant of, and perhaps members will perhaps benefit from some increased detail around this in the future report, is that all the recommendations have different priority levels attached to them. Um, it is not the case that all of these things are, are high priority. They also have different implementation timescales attached to them. And it is also not the case that we're in a position where we're saying that no progress has been made in the implementation of these. It may just be that there is one element of the recommendation that is still outstanding. So what I can say to you is that in terms of, of what he's showing there, yes, there are some issues which are still in, on the implementation journey, but there isn't anything that I'm flagging up to you as being of concern at this stage. But obviously if that changes, I, I will always draw those issues to your attention. Just another issue on the section six, which is the performance. Um, Laura's mentioned that you, you have fell behind due to changes. I was wondering if you could just give the committee a bit more uh, background to that and if there, if there are any uh, concerns. 
later this month to start to discuss that and take it forward. So we will be in a position to have a set of um, recommendations, hopefully for directors um, on that uh, basis. And then I will be able to bring something back to yourselves, hopefully at the next meeting, to tell you um, where we are with, with that. But there's definitely um, some real shoots of progress on, on that uh, basis. And then section four um, talks about the service risk uh, register and um, process that we are going through. So for the combined authority, obviously because of its newness, newness of um, many of the officers involved and uh, newness of some of the service delivery areas, we have been in a position where service risk registers have not been fully articulated. Um, and we are now in a process of uh, going through by those um, documents with heads of service and asking them to populate and refresh as necessary um, what is there. We will then be in a position, once we've concluded that piece of work, to be able to then discuss with directors synergies, the crossovers, maybe any gaps that that, that exercise has generated. Um, so that will be positive in terms of informing perhaps um, future risks that might feature on the corporate risk register. Service risks are those that score um, lower than 15 generally. Um, so, so those are ones that would be managed entirely within the service, um, but obviously have the potential to escalate um, to the corporate risk register if circumstances um, suggest. And then finally, section five is, just talks a little bit about how we are seeking to embed effective risk management in the organisation. Um, this is something that obviously internal audit facilitates and play, plays a key role in. Um, and we've undertaken a number of strands of activity, um, including um, presently presenting to heads of service on the risk management policy and helping heads of service to understand how that applies to them, but also um, uh, making a, a report to directors explaining um, the corporate risk management um, system and, and principles um, and how the uh, risk management um, risk register rather, will be reviewed over time and, and the role that directors play in that process. Um, one thing that I haven't included in the report, which is positive, is that we are uh, recruiting at the moment for um, someone to give us some support around um, corporate risk management uh, in the shape of a risk manager. So that will be very positive in terms of giving us some additional uh, resource and capacity in, in terms of enabling us to, uh, to deliver some of this and work very much with senior management to work to facilitate that. to be 
robust and perhaps that could continue to focus attention if we felt that there were any additional areas that we wanted to, to take forward. In terms of your second point, um, the service risks, yes, we, we have had to go through a process with heads of service on the CA site particularly, um, but not exclusively, um, of getting those service risk registers off the ground. That is entirely understandable because they haven't been here, you know, the Mersey Travel Heads of Service have been through this process and it's much more embedded on the CA side, it hasn't been, so we, we are getting that off the ground um, and it is just a matter of continuing to, 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 to keep that engagement going and ensure that we are in a position where we feel that we've got a, a good handle on risk at all levels of the organisation and that Heads of Service are clear in terms of the risks that they are managing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but also that the rest is very clear in terms of those corporate risks um, that obviously may feature more prominently um, and, and that that clarity exists. So at the moment I'm very hopeful that we'll be in a position to be able to complete this piece of work with heads of service um, and, and get to a point where we've got a much more articulated understanding of our risk across the piece. within the organisation 
And just to note that we obviously cover these as well during routine audits, but for some of these areas it is more um, pertinent to cover them as a standalone uh, piece of work, and so that is what you have there. So that is not to say that those are the only things that we that get any sort of counter-fraud coverage, because that is not the case, um, but those are picked out for you as specific um, examples of that. We've also given some detail uh, for your uh, National Fraud Initiative, uh, where we undertake matches both uh, within and amongst um, different organisations across the uh, public sector um, to identify any potential uh, matches which may hint at fraud um, or indeed error. And then section 5 talks a little bit about the reactive fraud work that we uh, have a provision for within the plan. Uh, we haven't at this point in the year had to draw on any of that uh, but obviously we don't know we may at any time receive an allegation which we have to um, may have to now look into so um, at the moment it's been relatively little um, in terms of what we've had um, and the only thing that we've really spent any time on has been con concluding the work on the Mersey Royal Leader Grant which you will have heard me talk about previously uh, which was com which was uh, completed early this year and that's already reported to you the outcomes from that work and then finally section six talks about the steps to embed fraud culture and this is very much around um, ident the identification of fraud risks, so the, the progress that's being made on the fraud risk register, uh, engagement with um, fraud groups across the sector, training and awareness and the progress that we're making in terms of getting the message out to the workforce um, and also the, the policy framework and the policy that is in front of you today, the fraud, bribery and corruption policy is the final piece in, in that jigsaw, so the other policies that are listed there I have pres already presented to you at a previous meeting, um, this is the, the final one um, and this really is the sort of overarching and all encompassing document which sets out um, in its sort of broadest and most comprehensive terms the organisation's approach um, to fraud, bribery and, and corruption. So that is in front of you for, um, for your approval. I'm very happy to take any questions. Uh, just, uh, it's, it's a paper deluded largely of numbers and probably for, for good reason as well. Um, I'm assuming um, that this includes, um, this initiative includes um, preventing the authority of the individual fraud through false insurance claims and stuff like that. Am, am I writing that first? Otherwise, I'll not pursue this line of thought. If, if, if that's the case, have we any data to hand or, or are you capable of producing any data which would show whether you know the profile for this authority differed from other authorities because that would obviously would be one prime indication of possibly fraudulent activity and I just wondered whether you have any of those kind of um, metrics that you study in, in terms of fraud initiative in order to pick up you know strange blips in um, claims or whatever yeah. So actually one of the um, proactive pieces of, of work that we've got in the plan this year is around insurance claims and that is very much looking at how we interact with insurers um, and the process that they go through to detect um, any potential fraudulent um, claims. So there are, as we know, a number of sort of national scams around insurance type fraud that, that many organisations have fallen foul on. I'm not picking up at the moment, it is only early days in terms of that piece of work not picking up at the moment that we've been um, that we have fallen foul of that we do have generally low claims numbers here and so I think the other thing that might be difficult in terms of, of doing benchmarking is that obviously we are rather unique as an organisation so in a local authority environments it's very easy to do that sort of benchmarking because the powers and, and the services provided by local authority are generally, generally the same so on things like hotel claims or tree claims you can do something of a comparison along those lines because we are something of a unique entity um, and even <coughs> uh, with other combined authorities obviously we're constituted differently um maybe difficult but i think that i'm not getting the sense that from the numbers of claims that we are facing particularly combined authority claims are very low um, that there will be much in terms of, of fraudulent activity however we will be seeking to get the assurance through um brokers and the insurers that they go through robust processes to ensure that any concerns are, um, are, are, are fed through and that we would robustly um, defend any, any claims for which we had such um, suspicion.
Liverpool City Region come by the authority single entity statement of accounts 2018 and 19. It's a mouthful. Um, please can you note that for this item a supplementary agenda was safely in consideration. Could I invite Sir Johnson, Head of Finance, to take us through the brief notes, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, so the purpose of this report is really to provide members of the committee with an update on the changes that we are making to the combined authority single entity accounts. Um, members will recall that there is a statutory framework for the completion and audit of the accounts. For the avoidance of doubt, the expectation is accounts are published on the website by the 31st of May, then subject to order and signed off for approval by the 31st of Ju July. As members were aware, at the meeting in July, we indicated that the audit hadn't been completed because there were a couple of outstanding areas which the auditors, Mazars, had flagged as wanting to do extra work. This briefing note really is just providing you with an update on what those areas, areas were. And a supplementary set of accounts have been done in such a way that we have highlighted where the changes have been made. So for ease of reference, you can see where they are. The final set of accounts have been changed in two respects. Firstly, um, in terms of the recognition of a capital grant from the um, combined authority to Mersey Travel for the rolling stock expenditure. There is a briefing note attached to the report which provides much more detail as to what the actual changes are. But in summary, previously it had been shown as unfunded within Mersey Travel and an increase to Mersey Travel's capital financing requirement. Having reverted back to the statutes um, and the, the powers, the, the view has been taken that this should have actually been treated as a capital grant from the combined authority to Mersey Travel and the accounts have been amended as such. The second issue is with regards to the treatment of cash between the combined authority and Mersey Travel. Now, at the group combined authority level, Mazars have indicated that they were happy with the position of cash. However, their query was how this was treated between the Mersey Travel accounts and the single entity CA accounts. Now, again, we've gone back to the statute and the powers and um, looked at where the, the powers to borrow, the powers to hold money and invest sit. And on that basis, it's been viewed that the, the cash should sit within the single entity CA accounts with an intergroup debtor relationship shown within the most travel accounts. Section three of the briefing note provides a lot of detail on that. However, to try and summarize, the relationship is such that Mercy Travel does not have the status of a local authority, whereas the combined authority does. That, that gives the combined authority the power to invest and to borrow. Mercy Travel does not have that, and as such, to the extent that Mercy Travel would have money at the end of the year, it would have to give it to the combined authority to, to invest on its behalf. So the change that's been made um, is between cash and debtors. So the, the, the amounts that were shown as cash within the Mercy Travel are now shown as debtor. And the figure in cash is all shown within the combined authority single entity accounts. The changes we've been proposed have been sent to Mazars and their technical team and they have indicated that they are content with these changes. So currently they are just going through the process of finalising the audit. The intention was that we'd be able to bring the final accounts to you. However, because of the process we have to go through, it hasn't been able to do that. And we wanted to bring something to you so you're aware of the changes that will be going in a final set of accounts to the combined authority in, um, in November. I appreciate it's quite a technical matter, but I'm happy to take any questions if anyone's got any. Um, obviously there's a delay to the time that this was due to have been signed off. Does that delay go against us in any way with the external orders? It's normally very good practice to try and ensure that you meet the, dead, the statutory deadline. Um, however, I am aware that I think up to 40% of authorities this year have failed to meet the statutory deadline. I think there's been a 
there have been a re-tender exercise of all local authority um, auditors through the, the PSSAA. Um, and that, that the first year of audit was 1819, and there appears to have been a more robust approach to the audit taken by the auditors, which really should be welcomed because it means that you know they're looking at everything in a lot, lot more detail. So while not desirable, um, we are far from alone, and I suppose it gives us the comfort that we have been able to work with them to identify a way through this so that avoids having the accounts um, qualified. adjustments to 2017-18 or is it just 2018-19? So because um, it was a historical treatment it's probably worth mentioning that the, the approach we've taken to cash between Mersey Travel and the Combined Authority and previously the ITA was something that was signed off by the previous auditors. Mazars have come and said that they, they didn't agree with it so we've had to take it back and introduce it as if we had always done that. So to that extent, we've had to bring in a third balance sheet, so it looks as if it's an approach we've always taken. And in any of these uh, financial periods or the entire fiscal period, all these transactions were taking place, uh, in your opinion, was there any, any other projects that were delayed due to cash flow problems or liquidity generally? Have any other programmes not been delivered or been delayed in being delivered because of these transactions? No, not at all. I ask, is there any more questions or comments? Thank you. Um, can, can we now agree the recommendations set out on page 89, please?
Further changes and consideration of financial procedure rules are being looked at at the moment and they will be reported back to you in due course. The other sets of changes relate to the Strategic Investment Fund. One of the issues that the um, authority recognised um, late, late last year and early this year is that delivery is incredibly important. And in order to speed delivery, there's a proposal to approve that officers are delegated the power to agree pre-development funding. And that will enable a scheme to get to a stage where the CA can take a reasoned decision as to why a scheme should proceed and be granted CA funding. The detail of those changes are set out, and this reflects the decision that was reached in October 2018, but wasn't wholly translated into the Constitution. And it's just important that we just correct that to make sure it's very clear for everybody looking at the CA Constitution who has the power to do what. One of the other changes in 4.15 is about the use of strategic investment funds, the SIF. The SIF fund is made up of a number of different funds. And whilst we want to maximise the amount of money that's delivered by the CA to projects within the city region, initially they may have been determined to be appropriate to one fund, so for example the local growth fund. But during the course of that project it may be that it's better allocated to a different named fund. This will ensure, by allowing officers to do that behind the scenes, that actually the funding is being maxed out within the city region. Those reports and those decisions will be presented to the CA on a quarterly basis, so if there has been a change, it will be dealt with on a quarterly basis to the CA, as part of the SIF quarterly update. The other change in relation to SIF is about thematic funds to spend on particular projects. So there are three projects identified at this stage, so Brexit Resilience Fund, an Inward Investment Fund and a Flexible Growth Fund. And this enables officers to ensure that we are taking steps that are appropriate in relation to those very important areas that impact on the region. And once again, this would be reported back to the Combined Authority by way of quarterly update. I'd just like to identify on page 102 that there's a change to a word. So at the very first line it says the principles. The CA are being asked to uh, agree that it's the objectives, not the principles. The second part of the report is, is covering the election of, of the next uh, Metro Mayor. And the recommendation is that the returning officer for May 2020 be Tony Reeves who is the Chief Executive of Liverpool City Council and uh, he is their Head of Paid Service. He would be supported by a number of deputies of whom Jill Cool, the Monitoring Officer of the CA, is one. The appointment is for one, um, one election 